Welcome to the Green Left Report, media for the 99%. I'm Simon Butler. And I'm Mel Barnes. In this show, we'll be interviewing the editor of Tracker magazine, Chris Graham, about current issues facing Aboriginal people. And later, Carlo Sands will give us his take on the Gillard government's backflip on refugees. But first, some activist news. Fans of boxer Damien Hooper gathered in Sydney on August 4 to support his display of Aboriginal pride at the Olympics. Hooper wore a t-shirt displaying the Aboriginal flag as he walked to his match. He was later forced to apologise for breaking official rules. Brother Damien, he's delivered a left uppercut to racism in Australia. He had every right to wear that t-shirt. I really applaud your courage in doing it. And I think it was a disgrace that the Olympic authorities had a go at you for that. They allow uh, flags of Dow Chemical and BP and all the other dodgy sponsors. I don't want to watch ads, I want to see this. Yeah, go Damien. Put on your brother Damien, you go proud and hard brother, be proud of your skin and colour. Don't let anyone just assimilate you out of existence. Go Damien, fight racism. Good on you Damien, knock him dead. Always was, always will be. On July 26, Tamil refugee Dayan Anthony was forcibly deported from Australia. He was handed over to the Sri Lankan intelligence forces who had previously tortured him before he was released. Refugee activists protested the decision to deport him against his will. We had the disastrous situation of a Tamil refugee being plucked out of a detention centre and put on a Thai Airways plane to Sri Lanka. Been selected for deportation back to Sri Lanka. It's a place where he will almost certainly suffer and be discriminated against as a Sri Lankan Tamil. He has compelling claims of former torture at the hands of the Sri Lankan authorities. So this man was then whisked off on the plane, sent to Sri Lanka, and the Australian officials accompanying him, instead of giving him over to his family, they handed him over to the intelligence of the Sri Lankan police. There's evidence of torture in this, uh, in this young man. He suffered a lot of psychological damage. That he was forced or threatened in that interrogation to agree to doing a press conference on behalf of the Sri Lankan government after being released. Thousands gathered around the country on August 11 to rally for equal marriage rights. The rallies coincided with the eighth anniversary of the Liberal and Labor ban on same-sex marriage. The Tasmanian and South Australian governments have indicated they will allow same-sex marriage in their state. This is a fantastic turnout. It wasn't that many years ago that someone like me was a criminal in my own state because I was in a relationship with another man. And I could have gone to jail for 21 years. And when I came out and I found out about that, it was almost impossible for me to imagine the day when I might be able to marry my male partner. August 11 was a national day of action to protest against a huge super trawler that plans to fish near Tasmania. Green Left TV was at the Perth protest and asked participants why they were there. The super trawler is disgusting because it's indiscriminate the way it, it, it trawls the ocean. It will take anything in its path, including dolphins, turtles. This super trawler should be stopped. In WA's waters right now, marine climate change is affecting the number of bait fish that are available. Penguins can't find enough bait fish to feed their young and they're dying in a dramatic rate. Our ecosystem should become before the profits of one uh, private corporation or one large trawler. Trawling shouldn't be allowed anyway. We need to stop this super trawler. Joining us now is Chris Graham, editor of Tracker magazine, which covers Aboriginal issues and news. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, man. Thanks, Thanks for Simon. coming. Pleasure. I wanted to start off with asking you about the Northern Territory intervention introduced under the Howard government. But the Labor Party has furthered this legislation and, and, and they've mm. um, now introduced uh, stronger Futures legislation. The ironically named Stronger Futures. Yeah, I wanted to ask you what, what these new laws mean uh, for Aboriginal people. Well, essentially, it extends it beyond the Northern Territory um, to to all Australians in theory, but of course in practice it won't be all Australians. But for Northern Territory Aboriginal people, it, just, it really just means an extension of the Northern Territory intervention for another 10 years. There's a few uh, moderations. They've made, uh, they've made income management, for example, uh, in theory, it's not compulsory, but in reality and in practice, it is. So, it means another ten years of what they've been enduring for five years, which, 
I mean, to put it in very simple terms, the suicide self-harm rate in Aboriginal communities in the Territory has doubled in that five years. So that's what they face uh, for another 10 years. Yeah, it's been criticised um, by people uh, who say that it makes life harder for Aboriginal people. But it does, yeah. irrefutably. I mean, the evidence is overwhelming. The government's own reports show what sort of damage this has done to Aboriginal communities. Um, beyond the self-harm uh, suicide rates, there's uh, increased violence, there's uh, much higher unemployment, school attendance rates across Aboriginal communities have dropped. Everything that it's set out to do, it's it's done the opposite virtually. Chris, I wanted to ask about uh, an article you wrote a few months ago where you mentioned that mm -hmm. Aboriginal people are five times more likely to be jailed than um, blacks were in apartheid South Africa. Yeah. And also youth in New South Wales, for example, 26 times more likely to be in jail than, than other youth. What needs to be done by governments to begin to turn this around? It's a whole of community problem. J um, jailing uh, has everything to do with access to education, to overcrowding in housing, to access to employment, to access to health. It's the pointy end of the whole suite of things and if they don't get the whole suite of things basically right, that this is an inevitable outcome. That statistic, um, it's climbing all the time. The mm. Northern Territory um, prison population is about 83% Aboriginal. Western Australia jails black males at a rate eight and a half times greater than apartheid South Africa jail black males at the height of apartheid in the early 90s. Western Australia has the highest Indigenous jailing rate on earth mm. and the Northern Territory now, if it were its own country, would be second only to the United States in terms of uh, the percentage of its population that it jails. And we're talking essentially about Aboriginal people. We're not talking about um, all Australians being jailed. The, uh, you know, the, we're all descendant of criminals if you if you believe the history books. Yet they're jailing Aboriginal people, not uh, the white fellas. Mm. And and one of the things that you've written about is the lack of consultation that the mm. government has in the Aboriginal communities. Yeah, look, the feature in Tracker, which is out this week, looks at exactly that. It's called "Who Put the Con Back in Consultation?" and uh, the allegation, of course, is that Jenny Macklin put the con back in consultation. Um, on the Stronger Futures uh, legislation, for example, they've, they've had this air of consultation with Aboriginal people, but that's, they didn't consult with Aboriginal people at all. Um, there was advice uh, in 2009 which was leaked which showed Macklin accepted that she wasn't to consult with Aboriginal people properly on Stronger Futures. Uh, there were two elections, mind you, 2007 and 2010, where Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory voted in staggering numbers against the Northern Territory intervention. In fact, in some bush seats, 99% of the two-party preferred vote went against the party that was running the intervention. That was the Liberals in 2007. In 2010, the swing against Labor, having had them run the intervention for three years, in some seats was 69%. And of course, the final tranche of the consultation process was the Stronger Futures consultation itself, which has been criticised by both Labor and Liberal in a Senate inquiry, and which has been roundly criticised by Aboriginal people as not being a consultation at all. The 2007 election uh, was the Work Choices election, people will recall. There was a difference, a margin, between um, uh, those who supported it and those who didn't of 3% across the nation. Now with a 3% margin, uh, Labor and Liberal accepted that was a mandate to abolish work choices. Um, Aboriginal people have been voting 90% against the Northern Territory intervention and yet they've just passed it for another 10 years. They push populist policies that have caused demonstrable harm to Aboriginal people. I wanted to turn to another subject now, which is the Olympics, and oh. <laughs> one of the one of the great moments of the Olympics, I think, uh, yeah. was was when Damien Hooper, uh, an Australian boxer, on the way to his match, he wore a t-shirt with the Aboriginal flag on he it. He did have their hair. Yeah, it was. Appalling. It made news around the world, and uh, it he, did. Yeah, and it really struck a chord amongst a lot of people in Australia. And I mm. wanted to ask you why. Look, uh, amongst blackfellas who I work with, they were over the moon. You know, this guy is the new god of Aboriginal. <laughs> Uh, the irony, of course, is that he's been he's been made to apologise uh, by the Australian Olympic Committee to the International Olympic Committee for wearing his flag. So he was made to apologise. He was made to apologise, and he did apologise. Look, what do you say? I mean, he, in in Great Britain, this was a big, big story, and Hooper got massive support in Great Britain, and and a lot of British were sitting there scratching their head, thinking. Why would this be an issue? This is an official flag mm. uh, of Australia. Why? What's the problem? 
the only people who had a problem with it was the AOC, who dobbed him in to the IOC. So, I mean, the idea that even just to assert, you know, your identity as an Aboriginal person, it's a political act, because he did get criticised for it from the mainstream media. He did. Know, Look, he copped it, and and that's one of the ironies that that an Aboriginal person who displays pride in their culture is that is interpreted by white Australia as an act of overt politicism at a non-political event like the Olympics, sponsored by Coca-Cola and McDonald's. I mean, mm. really, the, the hypocrisy on this runs very, very deep. And, you know, all he was doing was celebrating, A, his victory, and B, his culture. And he's made to apologise for that. I guess one to ask for your remarks on the, the level of, of hostility and resentment which seemed to pervade the media's coverage of the protests on um, January 26 at Canberra this year at the 10 Embassy. And yeah. What does this say about the media's coverage of Aboriginal affairs? I saw it all firsthand, and the media reporting that came out at the end of it was just run of the mill, um, depict Aboriginal people as dumb, dangerous, and violent because that's how white people want to see Aboriginal people. Um, these are commercial networks, and even the non commercial networks do it. The formation of Trackers is sort of a new publication, but is, yeah. that, a, is that part of the the need that there are so few opportunities for Aboriginal voices and issues to get heard. That was really its genesis. Purpose. And look, media is changing a lot. Um, I mean, this is a great example of it, of how people are able to access alternative media. And Tracker is fundamentally about advocating for the rights and interests of Aboriginal people, not just in New South Wales, but beyond, because of course it's owned by the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Council. But it's also about holding media to account, because um, no one does. So Tracker's brief is very much to take the media to task about the way they report Aboriginal issues and I've got to say we've got a lot of material to work with every week. I mean <laughs> just earlier this week Tony Abbott did a, uh, a trip to Cape York, an act of Christianity we had to believe. Oh he we, built a house. He built, he helped, mm. Well he renovated a library right. and um, it, was a, it was an act of Christianity that happened to involve a tow of press gallery journalists. He only ever goes to uh, places where he knows the leaders of that community will share his politics and Gillard does exactly the same thing and the media uh, get dragged along and they end up reporting fluff. Yeah, well one of the one of the most conservative media commentators in Australia is Andrew Bolt oh. and he, uh, earlier this year, he, he was successfully sued by a group of Aboriginal people mm, uh, for, for comments that he wrote in the media and since then Abbott has uh, said that he wants to overturn the law and Abbott tries to make it out like it's an issue of free speech and that you yeah. know, people should be allowed to, to say what they want but yeah. I wanted to ask you know your opinion about that about you know what's the line between free speech and, and, and racism? Well look it's a thin line indeed in Australia and the, the reality is free speech has never really existed there are always consequences for uh, your speech the defamation laws are exactly that you can't just say whatever you want about whomever you want and not expect that there will be some ramifications for that. Um, what they're trying to say now is they'll remove Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act and they will be able to say whatever they want about Aboriginal people and other minority groups, other races, without any um, broader implications for them. And you would only ever see that sort of policy pushed by someone who's never needed the protection of the Racial Discrimination Act, mm. i.e. a middle class white Australian male. because. Um, the Act is there for very good reason, and it's to prevent people like Andrew Bolt from willy-nilly uh, attacking Aboriginal people for no good reason, um, without some sort of consequence at the end. The only surprise really was that um, Julia Gillard didn't leap in and support him. Uh, she's done it on everything else, so I would have thought she'd back him on this as well. Uh, Chris Graham, thanks so much for joining us on the Greenleaf Report. Yeah, pleasure. And congratulations, it's a great show. Yeah, thank you. And now we move on to some more activist news. Miranda Gibson is continuing her tree sit in Tasmania after negotiations of the protection of Tasmania's forests broke down this week. Green Left TV's Daryl Davies climbed the 60 metre observer tree to speak to Miranda. Seven months living at the top of a tree has been an amazingly life-changing experience and while it's been such a critical um, campaign tool, I mean it has also been a really, you know, personal journey as well. Such a great thing that really because I was up here and, you know, exposing what was going on, they actually left and they haven't come back um, since. So, you know, all this forest around me would have been felled months ago and, you know, it's still standing today because I'm here and I think that's, you know, an amazing, um, you know, amazing thing on its own and obviously the issue is broader than this forest and I really want to see the protection of all high conservation value forests. My action up here, it really has to be a catalyst for creating um, change through other people getting on board and taking action. Canadian student leader Guillaume Legault 
toured Australia in July to speak about the huge student movement that has been on strike for months in Quebec in protests against the government raising university fees. He told students in Australia that they can do it too. In winter we had to prepare all of these general assemblies, find people to be the animators of these general assemblies. We had to make preparation of all of this and I think it's pretty much in the practice that revolutionary perspectives like come from what we are actually. Organizing is possible. We never thought we would be able to do this. So don't think it's impossible for things like this to happen here. It's really possible. Yeah. Legoy came to Australia to attend the conference of Socialist Youth Group Resistance. At that conference, young people were asked what socialism means to them. Socialism to me is... A democratic economy. It's social justice. Liberty. Cancel so well debt. Freedom. It's oriented towards human need. Living in a world where there's no racism. And into nations. Sustainability. Justice. We've got a purpose in life. Solidarity. Occupy your workplace. Power to people. Emancipation. Collective ownership of the means of production. No alienation. Freedom. To be able to be a creative individual to have a sustainable planet equality between genders people before profit no sexism no homophobia and harmony solidarity liberation mobilization revolution is the next step a place where people can make friends and you meet the best people in the world unity human liberation queer liberation a workers control not having to spend eight hours a day five days a week selling my soul freedom love art freedom balance between humanity and nature relating to each other as people not commodities Humanity reaching its full potential. The oppressed people of the world taking their place. Education for liberation. Environmental sustainability. We'll have a future. True beauty. Humanity. Love. Equality. 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 Hope. A beautiful utopia that we deserve. And now, let's hear from Carlos Sands. I'm Carlos Sands, and this is my corner. I just want to start by congratulating Tony Abbott on his extension to becoming Prime Minister of Australia. Well done. That really happened, I think, on uh, August 15, when his government passed his asylum laws, I mean, more or less, in totality. You got the offshore processing to Nauru and Manus Islands. You got the ability to turn back boats. Uh, his government passed that law. Of course, the opposition voted against. I think that is uh, Adam Bant and Andrew Wilkie. Uh, and we have to also, I think, congratulate the incredible trick being pulled off here by the Labor Party to make such a stunning transformation from Tony Abbott light to the full strength Tony Abbott. That was really very impressive. I don't know about anyone else. I personally cannot tell the difference. I just want to say, I mean, when we start doing this by mid-September, uh, Julie Gillard has said they probably won't be ready on Nauru or, or Manus Island. They probably had to put these asylum seekers in tents. What does she think about that? Well, let's ask Tony Abbott in order to find out. Tony Abbott asked about it, said, well, you can't expect five-star hotel treatment. They have got to be intense, so be it. I just want to here give a heads up to Serco, uh, the multinational company making millions of dollars running these private prison camps. Time to get into the tent industry. Seriously, Canvas is where it's at. Take a tip from Uncle Carlo. That's where the smart money is right now, in profiteering from other people's misery. One of the other stunning things about this, I think, is that it's not just a crime against humanity and a violation of international law, it's also a crime against logic. Because the argument that we're getting from Liberal and, and Labor uh, is that we are actually going to take these people, we're going to put them in prison camps indefinitely for their own interests. They're desperate people seeking assistance and possibly rather than worrying about whether or not when they come here this, rel this very small number of people might take something from us, maybe we should be worried about those who are taking things from us right now. Why are we not worried about Campbell Newman in Queensland taking tens of thousands of public service jobs, taking programs to test for breast cancer, taking them away? Barry O'Farrell, he's taken money from injured workers. Ted Bellio in Victoria, he wants to take TAFE away. Maybe, just maybe, we should be worried about that rather than desperate people who we should be welcoming and finding safe ways to come here. That's just a thought. You know, give it some thought. I just want to throw that out there into the national debate. I'm Carlos Sands. That's my corner. 
Oh, and to uh, Prime Minister Tony Abbott and Deputy Prime Minister Julie Gillard, I would just also like to add, fuck you! Thanks, Carlo. That's the end of the show. Until next time, you can keep up with media for the 99% by subscribing to Green Left TV's channel on YouTube or by visiting us on Facebook. We've now raised $35,000 in our appeal to get Green Left TV on its feet. If you can help, please donate and help us reach our goal of raising $60,000 by the end of August. Goodbye. Goodbye. Been organizing, agitating for to make some change. He has, he has. Where the rich kid blocks, they be calling me name. They are, they are. They're trying to make me believe I ought to go back to where I came. They're trying to make me believe I ought to go back to where I came. Well, I've been posting posters, writing letters, threatening with arrest. He has, he has.